Uh, good evening, thanks for staying with us. Uh, so I'm Peter Bloom, uh, Chair of Film and Media Studies at UCSB, and I'm really delighted to have a chance to talk with Doris Berger from the Academy Museum. And um, it's so interesting um, the way this evolved in the sense that um, we, I, I went with a group of students to the museum to see uh, the regeneration exhibit that Doris really developed as, um, as the co-curator of the exhibit. And there's a whole history to how that evolved that I think is really interesting. And maybe we could start talking a bit, Doris, about um, the curatorial side of uh, the museum and how the exhibit, Regeneration, where um, there's a, a focus partially on Dorothy Dandridge among other related figures um, in terms of how, how the exhibit was actually um, organized and its relationship to the larger picture of uh, the, the actual creation of the museum. Yeah, first, thank you so much mm -hmm. for inviting me, Peter. And thank you um, for watching this movie, Carmen Jones from 1954. Um, going back to your initial question about regeneration, Black Cinema, 1898 mm -hmm. to 1971, which is the exhibition that is currently featured at the Academy Museum until July. So if you haven't visited yet, please um, make your way down to LA and come and visit us. Um, this exhibition really um, celebrates and explores mm -hmm. and regenerates African-American filmmaking in American cinema. And it's really an underexplored um, history that we found in particular in that time frame. That's why we gave it that subtitle. And you might wonder why 1898, 1971, such odd mm -hmm. years. And that had really had to do with the research that we did for this exhibition. This exhibition uh, is co-curated by Ria Combs and myself. And Ria Combs um, is the director of curatorial affairs um, in, in Washington DC at the National Portrait Gallery and I'm the VP of Curatorial Affairs at the Academy Museum. So we both like, um, found each other in 2017 um, and started to develop this exhibition initially from an, an how shall I say, an experience that I had personally in our own archive at the Margaret Herrick Library, which is part of the Academy that house, it's a public library mm -hmm. um, that also has a film collection that is uh, accessible to everybody who is interested in film studies. Um, and in that collection, we have the Edward Mupp collection, which uh, has a few thousand posters and lobby cards mm -hmm. featuring African-American performers throughout the decades. Um, and when I was looking through this collection um, together with uh, my assistant, the assistant curator, uh, Raul Guzman, um, we found so-called race films, posters of so-called race films, and that sounds a bit odd, the term today, it's a terminology mm -hmm. from the 1920s. Those were films, they were independently produced films with all black cast, much earlier than what we've just seen, and this was obviously a Hollywood production, uh, but what we found were posters of all black cast films from the 20s and 30s. And those were films I've never seen and heard before. And I thought I had a good education and it actually really bothered me that I didn't know these films. And that led me on a quest to really explore this a little bit deeper. And luckily there were quite a few scholars who've written books about it. So I was being able to educate myself pretty fast mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, on this amazing parallel film history actually um, in this country. And that obviously had to do with segregation and the divided fields um, and injustices in this country where it was not possible to have a, a multiracial film production um, that has where people, black um, actors had the same, were afforded the same opportunities than white actors, for example, mm -hmm. or black directors, the same opportunities than white directors, which was not the case for a very long time. And so 
um, in the from 1916 onward, really, um, black directors and some white directors as well started to make these independent films. Mm -hmm. And they existed in all genres, which was really fascinating. There's adventure films, there's musicals, uh, there's westerns, um, with all African-American casts. And those films were shown in um, um, segregated cinemas throughout the entire country. Mm -hmm. And so it was kind of a parallel history. They were not shown in um, downtown LA necessarily, um, but you know, in, in, in different, it was a different movie history, a separate cinema mm -hmm. almost history. Um, and so that was the initial beginning for this exhibition mm -hmm. um, that had its long research phase. Mm -hmm. So we planned this exhibition many years before the Academy Museum opened. The Academy Museum opened in 2021, in September of 21. Um, but we started to plan this already many years before. And that's an important aspect to mention um, because um, we are part of the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences, who gives the Oscars every year. The next one is coming Sunday, actually. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, um, but we are also, we are a museum about film history. While we also look at our own history, which is the Academy Awards, um, celebratory and critically, both, um, we look in the same manner to film and film history. Mm -hmm. uh, and that means the art and science of movie making, as well as in, in the United States, as well as internationally. It's really important to us to be inclusive and diverse in our selections um, and to sometimes also look into forgotten or lost histories and bring them back up to the foreground. And Regeneration is exactly um, mm -hmm. an exhibition that does that. Mm -hmm. And the book that we have and a microsite that we managed and the curriculum that we developed for schools, all of the, these things come together in the package of regenerating mm -hmm. lost and forgotten histories. Mm -hmm. So, I, I mean, one thing uh, maybe that's important to explain is that the exhibit regeneration is also the first major exhibit uh, that had been presented at the Academy, at the, at the Academy Museum, and that um, the museum itself has a number of different kinds of exhibits that are there. Um, can you say something about um, the, the nature of how the museum is organized in relationship perhaps to different kinds of priorities or different ways of thinking about who the museum serves. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we have exhibitions at the museum, um, mm -hmm. four floors of exhibition spaces. Um, one, a very large exhibition consists of many components. It's called Stories of Cinema. It um, leads you over three floors of the Academy Museum that looks into different aspects about cinema history, connecting the past and the present, not necessarily in a chronological way, but really creating new dialogues that you might not think about. So at the mo just to give you an example, mm -hmm. at the moment we have, um, we just open exhibitions on significant movies and movie makers, as we call that gallery, and we feature a classic films such as Casablanca, an exhibition about that. We feature right next to it a classic Los Angeles film uh, such as Boys in the Hood. Mm -hmm. And as well, um, a filmmaker, a documentary filmmaker, uh, her name is Lourdes Portillo, uh, who really worked a lot on uh, women and um, violence against women mm -hmm. and border issues. So we really tackle completely different avenues, di different time zones, and create new dialogues about what does cinema mean to us mm -hmm. in different moments in time. This is just one mm -hmm. example. Mm -hmm. um, but so we have these exhibitions, and then we have two movie theaters. And I should not forget to mention movie theaters. We are in a wonderful movie theater here. Um, and it's such a joy to see movies on the big screen. So in exhibitions, we don't show entire movies unless mm -hmm. they are maybe a short format, three minutes or something. But um, normally a movie is 90 minutes, 100 minutes long. We wouldn't show that in an exhibition context. What we mm -hmm. show in the exhibitions are stories about a movie or its cultural interpretation um, or both sometimes. Um, 
in relationship with objects um, um, such as scripts, costumes, posters, uh, photographs, um, and then we show clips, we show ac mm -hmm. excerpts, we make montages uh, out of these movies. And our film program, however, is of course showing the entire films, sometimes including introductions, sometimes we have special guests and conversations mm -hmm. like we have here right now, mm -hmm. that give you a wider um, understanding about a certain film. And I think both aspects are really exciting for a film museum and important. Mm -hmm. um, so we have the David Geffen Theatre, which uh, has a thousand seats, uh, can show films in all formats, um, mm -hmm. from um, nitrate film to 35 millimeter, 70 millimeter, uh, and digital, obviously. And then we also have a um, 288-seat theatre, the Tedman Theatre, um, that um, can also show many formats, in not nitrate, but all the other formats as well, which is really exciting to have this in the mm -hmm. middle, in the heart of Los Angeles, um, in a time when movie theaters have troubles to exist, right? Um, we wouldn't show new releases, obviously. We are not a commercial cinema, but we show, we are like a cinematheque, basically. Mm -hmm. We have a film program that relates to the exhibitions, um, or sometimes has features uh, one director and shows a retrospective of a director. Um, so in relation to regeneration, for example, we were able to find some films that have been considered lost in our own archives. Can you believe it? Mm -hmm. I mean, and that was really amazing. And through different grants, we were able to cons uh, restore them and now they can be shown on the big screen again. Mm -hmm. And these two, I mentioned two films, for example, because they're really fascinating, two race films, uh, one called Harlem and the Prairie from mm -hmm. 1937 with the singing cowboy, uh, Herb Jeffries, and another film from 1939 called Reform School, uh, featuring in the starring in the leading role, Louis Beavers. And that was a major, major find. That movie was known, um, its storyline was known, but the film hasn't been seen forever mm -hmm. and people didn't know where it was. Mm -hmm. And so now to see these treasures on mm -hmm. the big screen is just really powerful um, and allows us to reconsider our film history a little bit. In particular, if you think about 1939. Mm -hmm. I mean, we all know this is a big movie year in Hollywood, mm -hmm. right? It's the year of The Wizard of Oz, the year of Gone with the Wind, the year of Stagecoach, the year of Ninochka, so many different films, uh, big productions. Um, this is also the year of Reform School, we can say that now, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, that features an African-American actress in the leading role as a head of a prison who tries to reform the prison and how to integrate uh, the young um, um, man into society a topic that is so relevant mm -hmm. today. Mm -hmm. Really, really powerful film. Um, so I'm really excited about this, like, bringing... Yeah, I mean, the, the whole question about the, the length of the films. So in a museum context, I mean, we're, we're more and more used to installations in terms of uh, contemporary art museums. And what's really interesting in terms of the evolution of film museums is that there's a, a kind of uh, merging of contemporary art practices of exhibition in relationship to a historical format and, and, a, you know, and a format that has its own history. Mm -hmm. And I wanted us to just start talking about um, the one soundie that we saw, Cow Cow Boogie, that features Dorothy Dandridge. And what's interesting about it when we went to the exhibit is that there's actually a console, a soundy console that um, is there as part of the exhibit. Can you explain a little bit about what the soundies were and um, how, how we might think about what they were? Mm -hmm. Yeah, soundies are a fascinating history. They are, soundies are short musical films, three minutes long. They always had that length. Mm -hmm. They were produced in the 1940s between 40 and 47, 
um, and they were shown not never on the big screen like this. It's the first time I've seen mm -hmm. it that big. It was amazing. <laughs> but they were shown in this kind of format, in a mm -hmm. jukebox for music video, music films. Not videos, didn't exist yet. Mm -hmm. <laughs> music films. Um, and the sound is featured always one song, one dance number, um, or one musical number. Uh, and that was an opportunity for um, also black performers to be recorded in a way and seen. These sounding machines that were produced by a company called Panoram, Mills Panoram. Mm -hmm. um, and they were freestanding um, machines uh, where you put in a dime and you see a reel of eight different soundies. Um, those sounding machines were standing in public spaces, uh, in cafes and taverns and restaurants. So they were not in a movie theater. Mm -hmm. So it was yet another way of distributing uh, musical performances on film, if, even if you didn't go to a movie theater. Mm -hmm. And that was during World War II in particular, really important um, uh, aspect of entertainment for a wider audience. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, what, what's really compelling about the Soundies box is that they really look like peep show boxes um, that have a whole history unto themselves related to the invention of cinema or the development of exhibition cabinets like with kinetoscopes uh, from the turn of the last century, and then their evolution into uh, a kind of jukebox, which is mm -hmm. uh, really kind of fascinating. And also this short format um, is also very contemporary in terms of how we engage with media today in terms of our phones um, and just the level of accessibility and duration really leads you to focus in a different way on what it is that you're watching. So with Cow Cow Boogie, one of the things that I was also attuned to is the figure of the singer and of Dorothy Dandridge and the way in which um, her iconicity and popularity may be partially associated with this short format film um, in terms of how the figure is presented, um, particularly during that moment. And, and I'm wondering um, whether your sense of Dandridge's work, uh, Dorothy Dandridge's work, whether or not these soundies were important relative to how she became known. I think they offer us a, a bigger and wider and more nuanced image of her as a star. Mm -hmm. uh, she made 10 soundies in her career. Um, she didn't speak much about them herself, mm -hmm. um, but she made 10 soundies within the year of 1941 and mm -hmm. 1942, within two years only. And within these 10 soundies, she had various roles and really a wide ranging role that kind of shows the gambit of African American representation on film in a way. Because there are soundies like we see, we've seen today, Cow Cow Boogie, mm -hmm. where she really plays with her sex appeal. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a genre mix, Western musical kind of mix. Mm -hmm. um, but then there are soundies where she is more. Um, um, a middle-class uh, woman um, mm -hmm. singing. Then there's a sound is where she had to had to play more um, delicate roles. I would say more exoticized roles mm -hmm. uh, in relation to the so-called primitive savage. And um, those roles are obviously more stereotypical um, mm -hmm. that we know in uh, film history. And so those roles she had to play as well, and she did play as well. So the soundy productions, which were, by the way, no Hollywood, they were not Hollywood productions. Mm -hmm. Those were separate production companies in New York and Los Angeles in particular to produce those soundies. There were small budget productions mm -hmm. shot in a day sometimes, really fast. Mm -hmm. um, often you see in the background a decor that you see in different soundies sometimes because mm -hmm. they would reuse things to save money. Um, the key was to distribute a lot of films quite oh. often. So mm -hmm. if you owned a sounding machine in your cafe or restaurant, you would receive a new reel of soundies, uh, of eight soundies every week. So every week you had eight new films to mm -hmm. show. Interesting. And, I yeah. mean, that's a really fascinating dimension to the circulation of these short format films for which there are analogs, uh, like the Vitaphone shorts that were made uh, during a slightly earlier period. But 
this kind of idea about short formats that could be, in a sense, uh, presented sequentially. And I think you mentioned at one point there might have been eight short films on a reel that would circulate. And the last one might be an African-American performance. And that was, that was very much related to where they might have been distributed. So yeah. Yet another um, part of our of racism in uh, structural racism in this mm -hmm. country, right? Um, African-American people did not only have to sit in the back of the bus, but also were in the back of the reel of the soundies, if mm -hmm. you think about it. Really uh, had a way of um, um, experiences, even though when the soundies were shot, that was not the case. It was just more the distribution turned out to be that way mm -hmm. very often. Mm -hmm. And that had to do with when those movies um, or soundies were shown in the South, mm -hmm. uh, that last soundie could be taken out of it, mm -hmm. which was actually a practice that also Hollywood had. There were so-called Hollywood specialty numbers. Mm -hmm. And Dorothy Dandridge was in a few of those films as well in the 1940s, um, as well as Lena Horne, for example, where they uh, would be a white cast film and there, were, uh, there was a musical number within the film uh, with African-American performers. Um, and it, these performers did not have any other roles in the film. So when these movies were shown in the South, these, as, these um, sequences were cut out from the film. Mm -hmm. So there's so many conflicted and complicated mm -hmm. histories mm -hmm. that we have in this country that are lesser known, I think, and it's important for us to create that awareness. Yeah, I mean, one of the fascinating things about the exhibition is um, creating an awareness of the duality of uh, black cinema that had evolved uh, in terms of production companies in Texas, California, uh, New York, um, Oklahoma, uh, among other parts of the United States, and it's a fascinating sort of story because what you come to recognize is that um, actually black filmmaking was an ongoing phenomena, but it was on a separate track. And one of the interesting things about what happens, particularly in the, in the post-war era, I mean, it, it happened before, particularly through musical acts, but in the aftermath of the Second World War, the the actual merging, the nature of the merging that starts to happen. And um, Carmen Jones is a really interesting film from that perspective, because by 1954, uh, the, the kind of notion of an all black film as a popular Hollywood film was in a sense on the decline. It was shifting towards a more integrated kind of context. But I, I was wondering, um, in thinking about the film, uh, what is your sense of this, the idea of Carmen Jones as an all black film uh, in terms of the cast? What, what's your perspective on that in terms of the nature of it? Mm -hmm. I mean, on the one hand, we have amazing stars such as Dorothy Dandridge in this mm -hmm. film, Harry Belafonte, Pearl Bailey, um, a very young Diane Carroll. Mm -hmm. um, so that is just great to see on film, on the big screen. Um, on the other hand, I find it really conflicting to know and to hear actually that the voices that we hear, the singing voices that we hear are not their voices. Mm -hmm. Even though um, Dorothy Dandridge, as we heard her in Cowcoy Boogie, can sing perfectly. Um, and so did um, Harry Belafonte, who had a singing career actually next to his um, acting career. Um, yet they chose, um, they chose to employ white opera singers to mm -hmm. sing um, mm -hmm. the songs. And that is a very conflicted practice, I think, mm -hmm. in this movie, um, that you don't see, but you hear, um, mm -hmm. if you know about that. Mm -hmm. um, yet it is exciting to see you know, to see a story unfolding with an old black cast in mm -hmm. the 1950s in Cinemascope, in Technicolor. Um, that was new at the time. Mm -hmm. Most movies were still, or many movies at the time were still black and white. 
Um, so that was great, right? Mm -hmm. and so it's, well, it's not well, just one kind of answer. <laughs> sure, <laughs> yeah. sure. Well, it's, it's complex. And I, I think the nature of a production uh, like Carmen Jones, which is a, a Fox movie of the era, of the era in a sense, um, leads us to also think about part of its production history and the fact that Otto Preminger was the director for this film, uh, an Austrian emigre who had this whole interesting history in theater as uh, someone who worked closely with Max Reinhardt in, in Berlin, um, you know, leaving in the mid 30s. And he had a very interesting perspective on how his integration uh, within the system, the Hollywood system of that era evolved because he was one of the people that was partially at the heart of it in terms of developing these really um, compelling narrative forms. So one of the things that comes up is the relationship of the director to uh, the actors and particularly Dorothy Dandridge. And I was wondering if you had any observations about that. Mm -hmm. Um, I, well, first, I think I forgot to say that mm -hmm. this movie is based on an opera, right? Mm -hmm. And it's based also on a Broadway um, musical that mm -hmm. was uh, created by Oscar Hammerstein II in the 1940s. And um, he chose at that time to make it an all black cast mm -hmm. uh, musical, which was different than mm -hmm. the opera um, uh, in Europe. Um, so that was a shift uh, mm -hmm. to the 1940s, and then it was kept that way from the 1950s for the film adaptation. Um, that, that is one thing I wanted to mm -hmm. mention before, because it's, it's a peculiar shift in a way, uh, because it means something else to have an all-black cast um, uh, uh, f stage play um, musical or film musical mm -hmm. in the 40s than it does in the 50s. Um, 54, exactly when that film came out, mm -hmm. was um, uh, Brown versus Education. Mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. a key case, a uh, judicial case that ended officially segregation um, in schools as a starting point, right? And this is the same year when this film actually also mm -hmm. kind of is segregated because we, mm -hmm. it's not an integrated cast, it's an all black cast. It's an interesting conundrum, I think. And as for um, Otto Preminger with, uh, Dor and Dorothy Dandridge, um, they had a really um, productive yet conflicted relationship. Mm -hmm. They also were uh, romantically involved. Mm -hmm. um, they also shot another movie afterwards, Porgy and Bess, uh, another all black cast musical mm -hmm. in 1959, also with Dorothy Dandridge. Uh, he also wanted to cast um, Harry Belafonte, but he refused. And so Sidney Poitier got that role. Um, mm -hmm. Another very complicated and conflicted mm -hmm. musical that actually is not shown anywhere to this date out mm -hmm. of uh, disputes of um, copyright reasons, mm -hmm. uh, musical rights reasons. So it's a mm -hmm. different story. but. It is really, I think his experience and background as an uh, Austrian emigre to the United States who came in a time, I believe he came to this country in 1935, in the mid-30s. This was the time when as he was Jewish, even though he was not religiously Jewish, but it didn't matter if you were Jewish in uh, Austria or mm -hmm. Germany during that time. Um, you did not have a job, you did not have opportunities. And it was way before the war started, right? And mm -hmm. it's a story that not many people remember anymore. But that meant that there really was an exodus um, of film talent from Europe to the United States if they managed to come here. Uh, it was not easy to come here. You needed affidavits, letters of support, visas. Mm -hmm. But if you managed that and you were able to come and people like Otto Preminger did, people like Billy Wilder managed, people like um, Fritz Lang, so many great directors that actually helped mm -hmm. shape, form what we know as classic Hollywood cinema. Um, and they were outsiders mm -hmm. uh, for a while, but then they made, they helped shape what would become mainstream American popular mm -hmm. culture.
Another feature of the film that's very interesting, especially after watching a number of um, African-American produced race films, is the issue of um, the color line and also uh, complexion. So the way in which race is presented related to uh, skin color, skin pigment, uh, the, the extent to which people can pass as white or are darker skinned. And it, it's interesting in the film, there, were, there are a couple of instances of that, the sergeant versus um, Harry Belafonte, uh, you know, and, and the way in which um, there's a kind of rivalry. Um, it's hard to say whether it's around the issue of skin color, but it, it's a feature that appears in the race film. Of the, era, of, the, of the period prior, uh, particularly some of the Oscar Michaud films. This theme about uh, passing for white and the issue about skin pigment uh, is a major, major theme uh, that's been part of the historical legacy of black film. And I'm wondering, and it's kind of an open question, the extent to which um, Carmen Jones uses some of those kinds of differences as a way to play off characters? Mm -hmm. It's a good question. I, I cannot say that for sure, mm -hmm. um, but colorism is obviously part of American history, as mm -hmm. we all know, and uh, also uh, seeped into film productions. Uh, also African-American filmmakers mm -hmm. um, often cast lighter skinned black actors than mm -hmm. darker skinned black actors, very often. Um, so yeah, you observe this right fully so in the yeah, film. Yeah, and, and the fact that it's in color mm -hmm. too, that it's not just in, in color, it's cinemascope, it's, um, they're very vivid colors, and in many of the black and white race films, sometimes you can't really tell uh, what, the, what the racial identity is necessarily of the figure, except for the context of the action that's in the film. So the fact of it being a color film of this kind also opens up this question in a new way, mm -hmm. I think. And it's just very interesting to reflect on and to consider. So it might exist along the same lines as voice, mm -hmm. as we were talking about earlier, in terms of who is singing for the figures that are on screen. And it's a similar kind of issue of who do they represent uh, in terms of their skin color? Um, are they representing themselves as, um, you know, being in control of who they are or not? And it, it kind of opens up this question of how does the industry organize this or is it patrolled in any way? And it's one of those questions that's very interesting in terms of how do we read and interpret the film. So. I would also say this is institutional racism. I mean, you know, that mm -hmm. was part of Hollywood as much as it was part of this country. Mm -hmm. um, these are harsh words, but they are mm -hmm. part of uh, the history of this country. Mm -hmm. um, and I really strongly believe that we need to learn more about that history in order to understand the mm -hmm. nuances and complications mm -hmm. and the struggles that resonate in certain ways to this day, you know, mm -hmm. of challenges that black actors in particular fa are faced with mm -hmm. uh, by, for example, the roles they're offered um, or the storylines that are given to them um, or the understanding what, what, can be, um, what can be a film that can be an all black cast film, right? Mm -hmm. and, I find it very, I mean, these are very complex issues mm -hmm. and um, the, the challenges that African-American filmmakers and performers had to face in this country for decades and still are to a certain extent are immense, but that's why I find the creativity and mm -hmm. the artistry that they bring um, facing these challenges even more astounding mm -hmm. um, and, and worth um, enjoying even though it might present itself with complications. Mm -hmm. So even though Carmen Jones is a film that is not um, 
fully embraceable, mm -hmm. you know, in all aspects. I find moments that I really find challenging to know about or hear or see. I also really, really appreciate and enjoy um, seeing these beautiful actors on the big screen uh, mm -hmm. in Technicolor. Um, so it is like a, a double, it's a multifaceted answer. Mm -hmm. um, and, and a way we see and experience history, I think. Mm -hmm. You know, another thing that's really interesting is in the exhibit itself, the regeneration exhibit, uh, there are some, um, I, I guess, sketches of her clothing relative to the, the film, um, among other kinds of ephemera that you found that actually focuses not only on Dandridge, but other figures. And I'm wondering how you were able to kind of determine, um, you know, uh, the presentation of these figures like Dandridge as certain kinds of icons or stars in the context of the exhibit. H how did you come up with that way of thematizing them in mm -hmm. the exhibit itself? Yeah, we have one gallery that's called Stars and Icons within mm -hmm. the exhibition um, of Regeneration. And there we wanted to, fig to feature a few, um, actors and actresses. On the one hand, we have one glamour wall that features over 50 actors and actresses that had careers in Hollywood during that time. And then we call out, basically have a few objects, a few more objects on, um, on particular actors such as Dorothy Dandridge, such as Lena Horne, mm -hmm. we show a costume from her uh, that she went stormy weather. Uh, and of course, um, uh, an actress uh, such as Hattie McDaniel, really important mm -hmm. um, actress not to forget, um, even though, and that's the double-sworded edge again, um, is she was the first black actress to win an Academy Award for her role that she, she played a mammy role in Gone with the Wind. Mm -hmm. um, the film is from 1939, the Academy Award was in 1940, um, she experienced real racism on so many levels. On the one hand, mm -hmm. obviously, the roles that she was afforded. She could have played any role. She was able to sing. She was trained in vaudeville. She always only was offered mammy roles. Mm -hmm. uh, and then she wins um, the first black person ever, uh, a, a trophy like that, mm -hmm. right, for that particular role. She was criticized by the mm -hmm. black community for that. Mm -hmm. But then she also said, I'd rather play a maid than be a maid. She mm. made those choices. Um, and then um, to, towards our own history too at the Academy, it's challenging to see, but I think it's important to talk about that she was not able um, to sit, at, she was not allowed to sit at the same table as the other cast members from Gone with the Wind mm -hmm. because it was segregated. So she had to sit with the um, partner she came with at a separate table. And then she wins the Oscar and needs to give a speech. Can you imagine how this must have felt, you know? Mm -hmm. And it's a really emotional speech that we show in the exhibition along with uh, different photographs um, and other materials on Hattie McDaniel, for mm -hmm. example. And about Carmen Jones, we were fortunate enough to, um, to find costume design drawings. Um, and that relates, we wanted to show different materials that relate to filmmaking. And whenever we are able to find them, uh, we would consider them to, you know, to include in our storytelling. Mm -hmm. um, and in this case, these are two beautiful costume design drawings, one featuring exactly this, mm -hmm. this outfit. Mm -hmm. And then another costume design drawing um, that Olga James, um, um, uh, uh, war in mm -hmm. the film, which was the love interest of, mm -hmm. of Harry Belafonte at the beginning. Um, so it's really nice to see different aspects of mm -hmm. filmmaking, you know, um, and we found those drawings at the Cinémathèque Française in Paris, mm -hmm. um, and they were not shown since the 1950s, so we we're really lucky to bring them back on loan uh, to mm -hmm. see them in our exhibition. Yeah, I mean, and it's to great effect, I think, in terms of really opening up the question of how do you organize an exhibit around um, films in terms of the different aspects of how a production is constructed. 
Okay, well, thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Doris. This was really very interesting and illuminating. And thanks to all of you for your questions and interests.